Well, as the title shows, there's two-part lecture here. So we'll get rid of the DIA first because I know everybody is so interested in it. We'll get rid of that really quick, and then we'll get to the Middle East because I'm sure we're all interested in the Middle East. Um, I want to thank Alan Wigan, a member of the board here at uh, the Green Mountain Academy, because back, like, back in March in Vero Beach, Florida, we discussed putting a, a lecture together and giving it up here. And uh, Alan, said, uh, Alan said to me, and I agreed, that uh, the Middle East isn't very interesting anymore. You know, the headlines are not gone. They're gone. You know, there's going to be peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We're going to negotiate a nuclear agreement with Iran. And so what hook can we get people to actually come to here? So it's obviously you're all deathly interested in the Defense Intelligence Agency. <laughs> so thank you for coming. My 45 years of work has been justified. <laughs> uh, I do have to make one, uh, one uh, acknowledgement. Uh, Gloria mentioned the Intelligence and Security Academy. My good friend Mark Lowenthal, who owns that, gave me permission to use most of the slides in the DIA presentation. Uh, they're, they're proprietary slides, and he's allowed me to use it. Next slide, please. Edward Snowden, over the past year and a half, I'm going to walk around. I hope it doesn't disturb you. Um, that keeps me awake, and hopefully it'll keep you awake. Uh, outlined a whole lot of information about the intelligence, U.S. Intelligence Committee, Community. It's a very large organizational structure. Uh, there's 16 different agencies. They work in the Central Intelligence Agency, and they work in six departments of the U.S. government. Everybody has to have their own intelligence agency or function. And why is that? Well, they're different customers. The Secretary of Defense needs certain things. The Secretary of State needs uh, certain types of information, the Attorney General, and so forth. So I'm going to break this down for you. Uh, my old friend Jim Clapper, who I worked for when he was the director of DIA in the 1990s, that sour-looking gentleman right there. Of course, he's being questioned constantly by Congress about what's going on. Um, runs an annual budget of over $50 billion. And if you look at the federal budget every year, you'll find that it's larger than housing and urban development, uh, not health and human services, because that does Medicare, Medicaid, and things like that. But several other departments of the U.S. government are you know, much smaller as far as the budget goes, $50 billion. In addition to that $50 billion, there's another 20 to $25 billion to go to tactical and operational intelligence in U.S. military forces. Uh, that goes. So you're talking an enterprise of $70 billion annually that you fund, you pay for, if you pay taxes, that is, and we all apparently do. But we consist of the Central Intelligence Agency, which is the only agency on all of those that is actually set up by the National Security Act of 1947, which established the Defense Department, the Department of Defense, and the Central Intelligence Agency. So that is by law passed by Congress and signed by the President. All the rest of these agencies, it's alphabet soup, are basically creatures of their own department. And the Defense Department is the largest part of it. It's got eight different agencies, uh, starting with the National Security Agency, who's been in the news because they know everything about you, me, and everyone else. The National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, they're the people that run the satellites. The fleet of satellites, the constellation, in fact, that we have running around the world gathering information. The Na NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, they're the people that take the images that the, some of those satellites collect and turn it into photographs that sometimes you see in peer. DIA, the agency I work for, is the Defense Intelligence Agency. We'll talk about it. And then the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps all have intelligence organizations. The State Department has the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, which is the smallest, probably, of all the agencies, but one of the best, because the people they have working there spent 20, 30, 40 years watching one country, like Iraq, or Cuba, or name a country, or an area. The Justice Department has the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. They have their intelligence. Department of Homeland Security has the the, this, the Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis, and the Coast Guard, 
which belongs to Homeland Security until we go actually to a war and then that would transfer to the uh, Defense Department. And the Department of Treasury is, has its own intelligence organization. You know, follow the money, you'll find a terrorist or a drug dealer or maybe one that's both, who knows. And the Department of Energy, they make our nuclear weapons. So who's best to analyze who makes nuclear weapons around the war but the Department of Energy? Because they have the scientists, the people at Lawrence Livermore and, um, and places like that. Next slide, please. Now, the Defense Intelligence Agency was established by Robert McNamara in 1961 after the 1960 presidential campaign between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Prior, in the late 50s, each of the military services, the Army, talked about 155 Soviet divisions, 10,000 Soviet tanks as a threat to the United States. The Navy talked about ballistic missile submarines and submarines as a threat to the U.S. And the Air Force talked about long-range Soviet bombers and missiles attacking the United States. So they had no agency, one agency that would put all of this together and say which is the most dangerous threat to the United States. And that's why DIA was, uh, was first established. Its first test was the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962 and 63. And what they did was analyze a lot of satellite imagery and an awful lot of U-2 imagery over, over Cuba and basically showed that the Russians, or the Soviets as we called them then, had put in medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles into Cuba using sat satellite and U-2 photography. The I got recognized for outstanding work, uh, mostly this work in 86, which was the uh, Libya counter Liberia operations. 1991 was the Desert Shield, Desert Storm operation uh, to free Kuwait. 94 uh, was in the Balkans, 96 in the Balkans. And 99 was some, uh, some still classified stuff going on in Latin America. The DI has nearly 15,000 people working in Washington at the Pentagon, at the Bowling Air Force Base where the headquarters is, and military and civilian employees. And they're deployed throughout the U.S. and at worldwide at U.S. major military commands. We'll talk about that in the next slide. The mission of DIA is the analysis and production of all source defense intelligence. So NSA does signals intelligence. NGA, NGA does imagery intelligence. DIA does all source, whether it's collected by humans, by technical means, however it's done. DIA is responsible for producing all source intelligence. The other two agencies that are responsible like that are CIA and State Department's Bureau of Intelligence Resource. The other agencies are more functionally oriented. It does collection. It uh, does clandestine collection. What does clandestine mean? Does anybody know? Secret. You don't want the opponent to know that you're collecting this information. That's, quote, the spies. But in addition, they also have a sort of an overt mission, the defense attaches, and we'll talk about that when we get into collection. It's the functional manager for MAZIT, Measurements and Signals Intelligence which is a very arcane science. It's like the CSI of the intelligence business. And we'll talk a, little more, a lot more about it. It manages the general defense intelligence program. That's things like drones, U-2 aircraft, the people, the personnel that are scattered at the US military commands, like the European Command in Europe, Pacific Command in Hawaii, Africa Command in Stuttgart, Southern Command down in Miami, places like that, all across the U.S. military defense department, they're there. They're, they do the budget for all of these people, and that runs about, according to Edward Snowden, about $4.4 .4 billion in fiscal year 2013, which ended in October of 2013. It's probably a little less now because they're doing it. The other interesting thing about DIA, it's responsible for the National Intelligence Un University, which is the only degree-granting uh, unit within the intelligence community. They, they, they award Bachelor of Arts degrees and Masters of Arts degrees under a fully accredited um, Middle East Studies or, or Middle State Studies Association. The only degree program in the intelligence community. Next slide. 
Okay, this is DIA's chart I took off the uh, internet on their unclassified website. This is their organization. And I want to highlight uh, a couple of things. J2, the Directorate for Intelligence. Does anybody know what the PDB is? Have you ever heard of that term? The PDB is the President's Daily Brief. It's put together by the, national, the Director of National Intelligence, his staff. Well, DIA, the J2 director, puts together the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff briefing six days a week, and that briefing goes to the Secretary of Defense every day and to all the major U.S. military commands. So the president gets the president's daily brief, the military uh, leadership gets the, uh, the, the, uh, the chairman's briefing. Now, the Joint Functional Co Component Command for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, you've heard of Global Hawk? Predator drones, those are the people that manage that entire program, the acquisition, the fielding and deployment of it. The operational activity is, is managed by the operational commands. But U-2s, other uh, electronic aircraft, uh, collection aircraft are managed by that. Um, the three main operational directorates are the Directorate for Analysis, which is looking at, I'll talk about them down here in the regional centers, the Director for Operations, that's the spies and the military attaches that are out collecting the information, human intelligence. And the Director for Science and Technology has two functions. It handles very detailed scientific and technical judgments, but it also handles the measurement and signals intelligence in, in information program. Finally, the Director for Analysis has four centers or five, four centers that are regionally based and one that is functionally based. The America Center, which handles Central and Latin, and Latin America and South America. The Asia Pacific Center, handling uh, Asia. European Eurasia, which is Russia. Middle East and Africa Center. Back in the 80s, I was the chief of the Middle East Africa Division back then. It was only about 150 people. Now it's about 500 plus people working on the Middle East and the Defense for Combating Terrorism Center that we've had in existence in various forms ever since the Marine Corps bombing in uh, Beirut in 1982. So that's the uh, DIA organizational chart. Enough of that. Let's get on to something more interesting. Next slide, please. All right, DIA's intelligence production. All source intelligence with the emphasis on military intelligence. It's strongest in comparing the capabilities of foreign military forces worldwide. 1971, I drafted these words for the National Intelligence Estimate on the Arab-Israeli military balance. Israel, or Egypt, is incapable of successfully crossing the Suez Canal if opposed by the Israeli armed forces. Fortunately for my career, I left the job, and <laughs> the guy after me dropped the last clause because I had been to the Bar Lev line on the Suez Canal and knew that it wasn't a defensive line, say like the Maginot line from World War I. It was a, a, basically a, a, a system of huge forts to protect Israeli soldiers from a, a artillery attacks by the Egyptians. So I moved on to a new job, but you know, that's what the DI is strongest about. Now, 1973, in, in um, late September and early October, we were estimating what the Egyptians and the Syrians were going to do. What are the intentions of Anwar Sadat and Hafez al-Assad? Are they going to attack Israel? Well, we, we had an assumption that we made, a very logical assumption that, as an analyst, you, you, you do make assumptions about things. And our assumption was that the Arabs had been soundly beaten in 1967. The Israelis were the strongest military force in the Middle East. The Arabs were not as capable militarily, and therefore they were rational people and they wouldn't attack. Well, Anwar Sadat and uh, Hafez al-Assad had different ideas. They knew they weren't going to win, but they wanted to shake up the system so much they'd get somebody like Henry Kissinger involved to try and move a peace process forward and get their land back via negotiation rather than from, uh, from uh, combat. So ever since then, we're now working on different ways to improve the ability to predict what foreign, foreign uh, leaders are thinking about and what they're trying to do. 
And so we have a lot more scientific world that comes out of the social science uh, area that, you know, alternative competing analysis, hypotheses checks. What, are you, what, are you, what, what is your bias in this thing? Where are you going with your assumptions? How, how are you missing other evidence there? But DIA is a technical and operational focus. And as I said before, they're deployed, people are deployed around the uh, U.S. military commands worldwide. Next slide. All right, uh, D, there are basically five disciplines that we put intelligence collection into. There's something we called OSINT, open source intelligence. That's what you do every day when you open the New York Times or whatever newspaper you do. You're doing open source intelligence. You're reading what's going on. That's the first thing that people in the intelligence community look at, what's being broadcast on television and CNN or Fox News or things like that to get them started for their days. The oldest profession in the world, or maybe the second oldest, <laughs> is human intelligence. You know, you know I, um, I want to know what you're thinking about. Are you going to sell me that property at the $50,000 level or are you going to try and insist it takes $75,000 out of my pocket? You know, how, do, how can I find out? Well, I'll take my wife and have her take your wife to lunch and see what we can find out. You know, that's, that's human intelligence. You're trying to find out something. Then you've got SIGINT, which is the signals intelligence, and uh, imagery intelligence, and uh, MAZIT. And we'll talk about MAZIT next. But we have over 100 defense attache offices around the world. Basically, U.S. military officers train to gather information and observe and report back. Legally deployed to U.S. embassies around the world, and their job is to ask questions and make observations and report back. It's been do going on for centuries. Countries have been doing it ever since the uh, 15th, 16th century. So it's overt intelligence, collecting on the host country military force. I think that's the Serbian defense minister and the U.S. defense attache uh, there, uh, you know, at some meeting. Then they have a defense clandestine serve, service, trained case officers. People are trained by the CIA how to observe, test, pitch a person, make them part of your employment so that they will clandestinely give you information that the host country doesn't know. You know, you've had things like uh, Aldridge Ames, people like that. Other people have turned against us. You know, we've had people in the Soviets that have, Soviet Union that gave us loads of information. So that's the kind of thing that DI's human intelligence mission gets into. Next slide. All right, now, MAZIN, Measurement and Signatures Intelligence. It's a very unique and arcane thing. It deals with a variety of emissions from object. DI is the functional manager, but NGA does stuff with electrical, oper oper optical, and radar imagery, and NSA does signals. DIA does the rest of it, and I'll get into it in the next slide, please. Mazin, it's extremely useful for issues such as WMD proliferation. 1998. Osama bin Laden's people attacked the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, President Clinton sent uh, cruise missiles and attacked terrorist training sites in Afghanistan. And also a, quote, pharmaceutical plant in Khartoum, Sudan. Mazin had showed that someone had been making chemical weaponry in this pharmaceutical plant. They were able to collect some measure and certain has diverse use. It can be done remotely at low risk. It's very expensive. It takes a lot of processing, and I'll show you some examples. And it's a little understood by most people. You can understand intercepting a telephone call or reading an email or listening into a cell phone call. But what do you, what do you think about Mazin? It's not very thing. It requires a great deal of processing and exploitation. Uh, next slide. The background here doesn't show up too well, but it's a symphonic orchestra. And here's what the Mazin process is. The, the orchestra is making a sound or a group of sounds that comes out into the symphony. 
you have a source, you collect the sound, the overall sound, and you break up various parts of the sound into various decibel levels and so forth. That sound, you measure it, then you process it. You put it into various categories, and you develop a signature. So the next time you hear that sound, or viola, you, you can identify it as a viola. And that's what Mazint process is. Next slide, please. It's a, I call it the CSI of technical intelligence. It's very technical, requires a processing. You can't see, this picture is from the movie The Hunt for Red October. Remember that? The uh, young black uh, sonar man, he's got those big earplugs and he's listening to the, um, the Red October submarine. Well, previously, people had been listening to every submarine or every ship going in and out of the Atlantic and basically making a database, categorizing the sound that that huge propeller makes, the cavitation that it breaks, and putting it into a database that allows him to be able to say, yes, that's the Red October, the submarine we're following. You know, following, that's what it is. So it's the taste, touch, heat, and sound. Ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles down to short-range ballistic missiles. When they light up, they send a tremendous amount of heat signature into the area. And the burn lasts for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 50 seconds. You can see them in Cape Canaveral when they put rockets into space. Well, you can measure that burn. And you can say that that ballistic missile is a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile and the way it launched off and the tra trajectory it's taking, it's going out to the Kamchatka Peninsula. It is not coming to Washington, D.C. or New York City or Boston or anything like that. Those are the kind of things that Mazin does. You had sound, I already talked about, the touch and the taste. You know, that person may be walking by that pharmaceutical plant, takes a swipe. I remember a young defense attache running in Moscow by the submarine, uh, by the, the subway construction going on there. And he had to stop and tie his shoe. They picked up a sample of the ground that had been brought up from 200 meters below. And that allowed the geologist to basically say that's from a certain strata of the Earth. The submarine is 250 meters below Earth. Why does it need to be 250 meters below the Earth? Well, maybe it's because the Soviet leadership has to go to a command bunker during a nuclear emergency. That's the kind of thing Mazint does. Okay, enough of that. That's too technical and you're all falling asleep. And I'll have to shout louder. No, next slide, please. So DIA in summary, and what we'll do is we'll t stop here and ask, answer any questions you have before we move on to the Middle East. DIA is the Defense Department's preeminent intelligence agency. It concentrates on military intelligence, but it does political and economic technical and information. It collects human intelligence and analyzes all sorts of information. It's deployed worldwide and at various locations in the United States, places like Charlottesville, Virginia, Quantico, Virginia, Huntsville, Alabama, all the major cities. We have briefer, debriefers, interrogators that are, sat, are sitting in the, all major cities in the United States. If you travel to some place like Moscow and go to a defense show. We would like to talk to you because you may have seen something that's very interesting to you in a technical form. It may also help us in our mission of collecting information on foreign militants. So that's DIA and what it does in a short unclassified presentation. Questions? Comments? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, a quantitative analysis. Talk about a qualitative analysis in terms of is it effective? Are all of these segments uh, working efficiently? Uh, how does this compare to other countries? Um, there's an apocry apocryphal story within the, the defense intelligence community that says something like this. The Chinese intelligence service thinks DIA is the most important intelligence service in the United States. 
is you're constantly reading about CIA, FBI, and NSA in the newspapers or hearing about it in the news. They don't hear very much about DIA. So maybe it's effective. Uh, personally, I've been places where they've done some exceptional work and where it's a human organization, they've done some appalling work. But overall, I'd give it a, you know, a, a much better grade than 50%. You know, is that the proper amount for $4.4 billion a year? I don't know. But from our point of view, this 50 billion plus enterprise has not had a major attack here in the United States since 9-11. So that's one way of measuring. It's, it's a totally gross way. But, you know, from my point of view, you've got to have many agencies looking at the problem. Our system is not like the British. The British go with a community, a community consensus. We go with argumentation. We'd rather have several different points of view and discuss that and come up to what is the majority opinion, the minority opinion. When Mr. Clapper releases a national intelligence estimate now, it's not just one opinion. It says the majority of intelligence agencies say this is what it is, but the State Department, INR, and DIA believe this could also happen. So they're trying to basically broaden so that we, quote, connect the dots in any way we can. Yes, sir. How closely does DIA and other intelligence agencies, uh, how closely do they work and consult with special committees of Congress and this, uh, uh, Congress uh, congressional committees of, of various types? And do they feel, for in your case, the DIA, did you, did you ever come to a conclusion about how much benefit comes from testifying before the congressional committee? Um, testifying before Congress is a duty. It's not a, you know, it's not something you can, you know, you can avoid. You have to do it. Whether the intelligence communities, committees, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, if they call you up for a testimony, you go, whether it's the director or various people that go up there. So they basically manage the budget. They decide on the effect of this. Are we making it be by basically allocating money for the next year? And then other committees, like in, for defense, DIA has to appear before the armed services because it's part of the defense department. So DIA appears probably before at least four com separate committees, the Intelligence Committee, um, the Armed Services Committee on both the House and the Senate side, the Appropriations Committee, the people that actually appropriate the money, and probably the Homeland Security uh, Committee because of the terrorism mission. So there's a lot of congressional oversight on budget. Um, and, you know, think about Benghazi. What happened in Benghazi? Four Americans were killed, including the ambassador. I'm sure the DIA had people up at every one of the Homeland Security Committees, the Government Effectiveness Committee, the Intelligence Committees, all saying, what did you do? Or what didn't you do? So yes, there's a, a tremendous amount of congressional oversight. The problem, of course, is most of the information is supposed to be classified. The reason why I asked that, that question is I recently heard, <coughs> to my surprise, a strong criticism of the um, congressional committees. And they were, being, they were criticized as being um, uh, the bureaucracy in them was so complex that it was that they were uh, on a whole. Ending, hindering the process, if you will? Well, they weren't, they weren't getting anything done. In other words, I often look at, at things that are going on in the Middle East and I say, why didn't we know about this? What is the, what is the process that you're describing here, which is extremely valuable? And I'm saying, don't they testify to, to, and, and upon, with various committees so that it gets passed up through the train and somebody knows what's going on? And, and, and the answer that this particular speaker was saying was that the bureaucracy within the congressional committee is so, so complex that very often nothing gets done. And I was wondering if you'd experienced anything like that in your in the Well, I was dealing with a specific area of the world. So we were providing mostly informational briefings. You know, what's going on with Iraq today or, you know, the latest military operation? Or what is the national intelligence estimate on Iran, say, what's going to happen? You'd go up and to provide both the staffers and the committee members, the member of Congress or the senator, that information. 
Now, what they do with that, uh, when, with informational. The other part was the budget hearings, the setting of the budget, that's where they, I think they spend an awful lot of their time putting the budget together, uh, even though the process hasn't resulted in a budget on the, on the day it's supposed to for many years in Congress. You know, that's just the dysfunctional Congress right now, political system that we have. That's my personal opinion. Yes, sir. Based on the fact that a lot of conflicts today are being started in tribal or religious uh, situations rather than country, do you think it's going to be a bigger challenge for the intelligence to actually get information from these various tribes or religious organizations as compared to a country? Well, I think what's happened, um, the intelligence community has turned to the academic community. There's an awful lot of people that go in and, and study um, uh, uh, tribal cultures, you know, you can find an expert on a, a Yemen tribe somewhere here in the United States in the, uh, in the university system. You know, so yes, they're trying to go. And it, sometimes the, uh, the people in the academic system don't want to associate with the intelligence community for, you know, the fact that if they, they do, then maybe they go to the Yemen and it's the last time they're seen or something like that, you know. But we, we you know, we have tried to reach out. They have what they hold in Iraq and Afghanistan, human resource teams that are basically scientists, social scientists that have studied Iraq or Afghanistan, know, supposedly know the tribes, the clans, the arrangements, uh, the religious activities of all, and, and helping the U.S. military to, to deal with the people that they're, they're, they're uh, for. Of course, all of those people have pulled out of Iraq and now they're uh, pulling out of Afghanistan. So yeah, it really depends on the crisis, how detailed the understanding is. But the Middle East across the area is such a sectarian, tribal thing that, you know, those nice straight lines that we'll see on the map are kind of useless as far as border. Yes, sir. Help, help us understand how DIA fits in relative to all the other bureaucracies, as, as was mentioned earlier. How does DIA overlap or work with the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, National Security Council, whatever. There must be an awful lot of overlapping agencies in oh, yeah. the same area. Yes, and you know that's that's the beauty and the ugliness of it, because you've got experts in DIA or INR or CIA or somewhere in the community that know something about it. Just like you have policymakers that are dealing with it. So, for instance, if the president wants to have a national intelligence estimate on um, what's happening in Iraq. Will Iraq stay as a country, as an example? Or will it break apart in, like Yugoslavia, into three different, a Kurdish country, a Sunni country, a Shia country? Well, then what happens is the uh, National Intelligence Officer for the Middle East will call a meeting of all the experts, the senior experts from around the agency. And basically people will come together and they'll say, okay, here's what we're thinking, here's, where, here's who we have, Here's who we can help put the NIE together. And, you know, the NIE may have to be produced in, in three weeks, which is a huge undertaking. But the people will, you know, maybe a DIA expert will write part of it. An FBI expert may write part on the, you know, the terrorist threat. CIA will write the overall report. And then that, that will put together. And then they have a meeting. They argue over each and every word almost all the time. Uh, it comes to a final conclusion. It goes to the leadership in the intelligence community. And then General M Mr. Clapper, now formerly General Clapper, signs his name to the NIE and says this is the considered judgment of the intelligence community. It's, it's got his name on it from the Director of National Intelligence. That's one way it's handled. The other way is current intelligence. Well, I talked to the President's daily brief. It goes to the president every day. It's written by and it's coordinated very quickly amongst the analysts and goes that way under the, the DNI's imprimatur. It's not actually signed by. So there is coordination uh, continuously going on with regard to things. Does that help? Still, I assume still a huge amount of overlap. Yes, there is. And the system's designed that way. Okay. Um, it's built in because, you know, we can. Uh, the British can't because they don't have that much money and they don't have that many resources. We've designed a system that we have multiple masters in the intelligence community 
up the, the military chain of command for the Defense Department. You know, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff get a copy of the President's daily brief every day because they're part of the National Security Council. By law, the National Security Council consists of the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the military advisor to it. They get what the President gets every day. Yes, sir. Uh, apropos of the question uh, for us, do we have a, uh, an active, aggressive interface with our allies or suppliers in confrontation and alliance? Well, I would say we have an excellent relationship with countries like the UK, Australia, Canada, uh, people that we fought World War II with and since then have been allied together. We might have, we have an excellent relationship with Israel. We have a very good relationship with Egypt. Uh, we have NATO countries that we have very excellent relationships with. Korea, Japan, in the Far East. Uh, do we talk to hostile intelligence services? Yes. Of course we do. We may not tell them everything they want. They certainly don't tell them everything we want. But that's, that's the nature of our business. So yes, I think we do have uh, a very active uh, sharing of information, certainly with our key allies and countries like that. So. OK, let's turn to the next slide. The mess in the Middle East. Back in March, it wasn't much of a mess. We were heading towards peace. Um, 24 years ago, I told my son in college, JP, study the Middle East. I can guarantee you a job for the rest of your life. <laughs> Being a true son, he said, no, Dad, I'm going to study international business, and I'm going to study Latin America, mainly because he had a girlfriend from Argentina. Well, my son subsequently joined the United States Army. He's now a major. And he spent four years in the Middle East now, since 9-11, in Egypt, 15 months in Iraq, 14 months in Afghanistan. So it was a mess back then. It's a mess now. I have two grandsons. One's a medic in the Army now, 20 years old. At four, in the 4th Infantry Division, and I have another grandson who's a cadet at, or a, a plebe at the Naval Academy. I told them to study the Middle East. <laughs> what are they doing? One's, one's studying Russia, and the other's studying medicine, you know, so they don't listen to their grandfather. But I could have guaranteed them a job. All right, let's turn to the next slide. I want to talk about these different subjects on Middle East turmoil. The Arab Spring was what? It was like the Prague Spring. It was like the uh, Orange Revolution in Ukraine, right? The, the autocrats are going to be overthrown. Peace and democracy was coming to the Middle East. Well, good luck with that. What's the only, they mean two democracies in the Middle East, functioning democracies. Israel? Israel? Tunisia. Who, Tunisia. Tunisia, very good where the Arab Spring actually started, and where the army was not directly involved. There's a lesson there for you. We'll get to that when we get to it. Um, three weeks ago, when I started putting slides together, Iraq was down here. And as things progressed, it moved up to the top of the list. So it will be the first country I talk about. Iran and the nuclear negotiations continue. Syria's civil war is just an appalling event that's going on. It's affecting everyone, starting to affect Americans. And I'll get to that. Egypt's retreat from democracy. They elected a Muslim Brotherhood, an Islamist government. And the army threw them out. But an awful lot of the people wanted the army to throw them out. The peace process. Well, it's on life support. Secretary Curry's effort didn't work out too well. And then we've got a few other countries in crisis we'll get to, and then finally we'll sum up. What does the future look like? Looks like the past. Looks like the present. It looks like a mess. But I'm foretelling what I'm going to say. Next slide. Tunisia started the Arab Spring. 
when a young man decided he could, no longer could pay bribes and uh, set himself on fire. And it led to a revolution that threw, overthrew an autocrat. And now it's still functioning. They had elected Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, to run the parliament. And then they unelected them and put a new parliament in. It's actually functioning, much to the surprise of everyone in the Arab. That's the only country. Now. So the Arab Spring was a real mirage. You had a revolution start in Egypt. It overthrew the autocrat. Then the Brotherhood was elected in. Then the army overthrew the Brotherhood. We're back to square one. We had a, you, know, you know, demonstrations in Syria. And now we've fallen into a civil war. We had demonstrations in the Sunni-controlled areas of Iraq demanding more sharing of power from the Shia government. And now you have this Islamic extremist group basically taking power. But the Islamists failed at ruin, ruling. They were just as bad as the autocrats. They accumulated power. There is no tradition of sharing power. It's a winner-take-all mentality. It's like the bazaar. When you go to the Middle East, how many people have been to the Middle East here? Where have you been? What countries? Israel. Israel. Jordan. Jordan. Egypt. Yes. Oman. Morocco. Morocco. So every, every one of these has a, a bazaar. Bahrain. Bahrain, okay. Very good. A lot more people, many places than, uh, than I would expect in an audience like this. But that's great. But every time you go to a bazaar to buy gold, to buy a rug, buy whatever, it's a negotiation, isn't it? And you want to win. And that's what politics are. It's a winning negotiation. And the winner takes all, unfortunately. The Democrats have lost out to the monarchs. You know, not a single king has been overthrown since the Arab Spring. In fact, none of them are tottering. Maybe the Jordanians are a little weak, but that's it. Instability is the norm for the future. And unfortunately, the United States government has pivoted toward Asia. You know, we're backing away from Afghanistan. We're getting out of Afghanistan. We're, you know, we're not as, you know, we're not involved in Iraq anymore, so what leverage do we have in Iraq? You know, the administration is basically trying to turn a new page to get away from detailed involvement in the Middle East. Okay, let's turn to Iraq. Next slide. So the headlines this week, the past week, radical Sunnis, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Daesh, as it's known in Arabic, and the shorter name, IS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, has taken control of the north and west, north of Baghdad and western areas, taking the, quote, second largest city, Mosul, which were Sunni dominant, there were Shia, but mostly Sunni. The Shia military there basically left, because for the past five years, remember what happened when the General Petraeus led the surge? We essentially bought off the Sunnis. We paid the tribes to switch sides. We spent a lot of money buying them off, or renting them, I guess is the best way to describe it. You know, and it worked for us, our casualty. My son was the mayor of a city called Taji, 20 miles north of Baghdad. And before they started paying the people off, they were, you know, in desperate combat. You know, his, uh, one of his soldiers was put up for the Medal of Honor in his company. That's the kind of combat they were in. So you put up, you know, that kind of activity, and if you can buy somebody off, that's money well spent. But Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, decided that he didn't want to be spending money, Iraqi money, on Sunnis when, he, when, the, we, when they left. So he started giving the money to Shia, or not giving any money to the Sunnis. So naturally, a group like ISIS is saying, we can protect you from the evil Shia army, the Iraqi army. And so they've had incidents of protest. The Iraqi vice president, who's a Sunni, is accused of treason by Maliki. He fled to Turkey. You know, essentially there's a grievance going on amongst the people. The Kurds take advantage of this, the independent Kurds. They want Kirkuk as their capital, the fourth largest city in Iraq. So while the government is retreating and the ISIS is coming forward, 
They've taken control of Kirkuk, the oil producing area in northern Iraq. They've established a pipeline that goes directly into Turkey. They could become independent, leading a Kurdish state. So Maliki is trying to form a new government, and what are we doing? Now we're talking, apparently, according to today's headlines, to Iran to basically work out a deal to tell the Shia prime minister, yes, if you want to end this crisis, you have to share power with the Sunnis. Well, I hate to say this, but I'm an intelligence officer. And congenitally, when we take a, a Myers-Briggs test, we come out on the pessimist side. The diplomats come out on the optimist side. There's no problem they can't solve. But I'm basically saying to you, in my view, you can't have a tiger change its stripe. Maliki is a Shia, sectarian autocrat. He may basically say, oh yeah, give me a couple airstrikes, bomb a few places, but where are we going to bomb? You know, you're not talking about 100,000 people, you know, in this ISIS group. But there's less than 10,000 of these characters. They melt within the population. So, are we at a very level, do, should we go back in and help this man out? That's a question for Americans to think about as you look at the headlines. Is this group going to take Baghdad? I don't think so. They've gone about as far as they can go. Next slide, please. Here's the uh, map of the area. They were basically on the Euphrates River in Syria. These cities along the river, the border crossings, Ramadi, Fallujah, they've had for over three months. Baghdad, of course, is over here. They're very close to the west of it. And then they took Mosul. So they've got this area like here. Kirkuk is the, is the area that the Kurds moved from their re regional government and expanded out into here. And you've got a mixed Sunni Shia area that they're fighting back and forth in. That's where the fighting's going to continue for the next couple of weeks as the uh, Shia basically organize. The sectarian militias come back on the Shia side and they start to go north pretending to be an Iraqi army. And so we're looking at what the ISIS is trying to do is create a caliphate, as they call it, in their literature. This is a state that is going to live by Sharia law, you know, no alcohol, Women, you know, are in their proper place, way behind us, and not doing anything that, you know, is useful. And that basically, it's back to the Prophet Muhammad's time. You know, it's not back to the future, it's back to the past, when people were, you know, much more... Now, they will commit excesses. They've committed excesses when they were the Islamic State of Iraq only. And that led to a lot of the Sunni tribes in Iraq to turn against them when we bribed them because they had basically stolen their daughters and sisters and cousins and basically committed excesses. You know, if you uh, were caught drinking, you had your head chopped off. There was a video just this weekend of some 1,700 Shia men uh, rounded up and, uh, uh, you know, executed. So they're already committing the excesses. The real question is, can this Baghdad government respond? It fell apart. The military fell apart because the military had become corrupt. When we were there advising them and paying for it, we could say that, you know, this man is a good commander. He should command a brigade. Uh, you know, this man is a very good commander. He should be a corps commander. And they had to listen to us. Now, Mr. Maliki chooses this man who paid him 100,000 dinars and is his cousin to become the, div you know, the division commander. That's the way the, the system runs. And when it became time to stand up to fight against ISIS, he went to Jordan, left town, took all his money and left. And that's, that's the, you know, the tragedy of what's left now in Iraq. So... It's still the question is out. They haven't gotten to Baghdad. I think they're going to be stopped. Then they're going to you know, move, uh, move away, push them back. But what has happened? They've raided so many banks, they've gotten close to a half a billion dollars. Several hundred tanks, artillery pieces, 
you know, a whole lot of loot that they basically have taken back into the great desert there between Syria and Iraq. And where is that going to, 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 to uh, you know, where is it going to be used next? Is it going to be used in Syria? Is it going to be used against Jordan? You know, we don't know what the, the intentions, but other than that they want to have a caliphate. So what we're ending up with is like Afghanistan <coughs> after the Russians pulled out. It's a wild west. And these guys are the most dangerous, organized, and vicious group there. So it's going to be a real threat. And for us, next slide. Oh, let's go back one. I'll get to it in the Syrian thing. I'll talk about it more in the Syrian thing. Um, you know, Iraq is going to be an issue through the rest of the summer for us until this thing works itself out. And of course, we're coming up to the holy month of Ramadan, starting in July, when activity should stop. But, you know, the sectarian divide between Shia and Sunni is just going to get worse over the course of the summer. There'll be massacres on both sides. And are we going to join with the Iranians in propping up the government in Iraq? Because the Iranians are basically the biggest prop for the, Iranian, for the Shia-led government. It's their same sectarian counterpart. So it's a real issue that we, we have to think about. And you'll need to you know, think about it, how you want to talk to your congressman and senator. Do we need to do something like that? Because there's a debate going on now. Lindsey Graham says, yes, we should. John McCain says, no, we shouldn't. The administration is talking to the Iranians now in Geneva on the sidelines of these nuclear negotiations. So that's the Iraqi mess that we've, we've left with. Next slide. Let's turn to Iran. This wonderful gentleman, Mr. Former President Ahmadinejad, is walking amongst the tw one of the couple hundred of the 20,000 know, 20, centrifuges that are spinning, making enriched uranium, up to 5%, up to 20%. To make a nuclear weapon, you have to go above 90% enriched uranium for a bomb. But it's a mechanical process. Once you get to 20%, it's just a matter of spinning better and quicker. U.S. intelligence community in 2007 in an unclassified NIE said Iran has the structure, the material, the enriched uranium, and the scientific capability to make a nuclear weapon. But it hasn't decided to make one yet. It has what we, they call a breakout capability. So it's a question of how do you roll this thing back? The US has been insisting in these permanent five plus one negotiations to reduce the number of centrifuges. The Iranians are saying, we have to make our own nuclear material enriched uranium because when the Iran-Iraq war occurred in the 1980s, the West and everyone cut us off from all kinds of military supplies, and so therefore we have to be independent. That's their right to have a nuclear, peaceful nuclear program. They call it a peaceful nuclear program. And so the question is, you know, what kind of an agreement, the deadline for the agreement is supposed to be July of this year. Britain, China, France, and Russia, and U.S., Oh, by the way, all f five permanent members of the Security Council. And what do all five have in common? They have all have nuclear weapons. So we're saying to the rest of the world, we got them, but you don't need them. You know, is that fair? I don't know. July 2014, next month, is the deadline for an agreement to end the nuclear impasse, to get Iran, you know, Iran wants to get off sanctions, tough international sanctions, and that's the hammer we're holding over them. And the U.S. wants to basically put the program in a box so that they can't break out and make a nuclear weapon in six months to a year. And that's the fundamental dile dilemma that people are negotiating in Geneva and Vienna as we speak today and into the next month. We'll see. I, my bet is that they'll say, well, it's very tough, we're almost there, we're going to need more time, and they'll kick the can down the road. And basically, we'll, go, we'll, we'll wander off for the rest of 2014 be looking for a nuclear deal. Next slide. Now, 
For years, people have said, let's destroy the nuclear facilities in Iran. It'll set back the program, and we'll have a, you know, a couple of years. Well, Iran is a very big country. It's, a, it's about the size of Texas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska. You know, the Midland part of the United States. And the facilities are spread all over the country. You've got enriched uh, uranium enrichment facilities, Natanz, Kom, Fordow, some of which are deep underground. It takes very specialized weapons to get it. You've got the Russian-built nuclear power plant down in Bushir. You've got a heavy water reactor that's under construction in Iraq. All of these things are being negotiated. But one thing is important to know, that since we have this interim agreement, the International Atomic Energy Agency has said they've had more cooperation in the past six months from Iran on questions of importance like research into making nuclear weapons, uh, research into it, you know, uh, revealing facilities. So they want an agreement. We can, we can, the United States can, basically take out these facilities. But what's the result of that? What do you think the result would be if we attacked their nuclear facilities? What would the Iranians do? If I was an Iranian leader, I'd go hell-bent for a nuclear bomb. I'd get a nuclear claim. The Iranians look at, have we, what have we done in North Korea? Nothing. Nothing. We haven't attacked North Korea. So the lesson they take, what do we do to Iraq that had a, quote, nuclear program? The lessons they take, if, if we attack them and strike these nuclear facilities, or if Israel attacks them and strikes these nuclear facilities, they're going hell-bent for leather and become the 12th nuclear power. That'll mean Israel, Pakistan, India, Iran. Who's going to be right behind them, buying a nuclear capability? The magical kingdom of Saudi Arabia, right? and you're just going to have nuclear weapons exploding. Egypt will say, well, we have to have nuclear weapons. So, you know, we've got a very difficult situation here with regard to this Iranian nuclear issue. Next slide. By law, the Iranian constitution has a supreme leader. And the power structure is shown here. As former president Ahmadinejad ends his term, new president Rouhani takes over, they are sitting below the supreme leader, Ayatollah, a religious figure, Ali Khamenei. He's the supreme leader. He's decided that we need to get out of this, they need to get out of this problem. And Rouhani, who was his trusted delegate for many years on their National Security Council, has the mandate to get an agreement on Iran's terms. They want a nuclear program, peaceful nuclear program, and they're willing to make a deal right now. So the question is, can we come up with a deal? The conservatives, the people in the Re Revolutionary Guard Corps, and some of the wackos that run, run around the country are on the defensive right now. If a deal is struck, the Supreme Leader will buy it. But it's a big if. And we could have you know, a, a period of tension starting after July. Next slide. March 15th, 23 kids in Dara in southern Israel spoiled, put graffiti on walls and said, Assad must go. We need freedom. The 23 children were taken in by Syrian intelligence, tortured, mutilated. About six of them were killed. And that started the revolution in Syria. And it's morphed into a civil war. The best estimate is over 162,000 people killed in less than three years. That's military, rebels, and civilians. Nine million out of 23 million people have been displaced, both internally and externally. Think of that. You know, that's well over a third of the population. Almost 40 of the population has either fled to neighboring countries or moved within their own country and given up their home or their apartment and so forth. The untold suffering. It's a stalemated civil war, and I'll show you in a map. Actually, there's several civil wars going on in Syria now. There's a civil war between the Sunni rebels and the government. There's a civil war between ISIL 
and the moderates in the rebellion. There's a civil war between Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda-sponsored affiliate in Syria, and ISIL, which is not sponsored by Al-Qaeda. It's a renegade organization, according to the, the successors to uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. So you've got almost three civil wars. And at the same time, this very handsome gentleman and his very pretty wife, Bashar and Asma al-Sad, voted in the election earlier this month, where 77% of the Syrian people voted. And 97% of those people voted for Bashar. The other 3% were all sent to prison or in, in mental facilities. Yeah. Re-elected for his third consecutive term. This, this election, for the first time in Syrian history, was not a plebiscite. It wasn't a yes-no vote. There were actually two other people running against him. Of course, he handpicked them. And, you know, they, their campaigns got less than, you know, 1% vote. So he controls the area from Damascus and the key lines of communication up the spine. If you think of Interstate 81 or Interstate 95 going north and south, and then you think of Interstate uh, New York State Thruway going east and west. He controls those key areas there. The rebels control the countryside in the north, the east, and near the Jordanian border. Here's the important thing that's helped him in the past year. Iran, Hezbollah, Iraqi volunteers, and Russia have provided him strong support. Every military contract that Russia has had with Iran or with Syria has been honored. In fact, more have been negotiated. What have we done to help the Syrian rebels? We're still trying to figure out who the moderates are. You know? So... They doubled down. Sunni and Arab and Western support. We're working with the magical kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the, uh, the lovely emirate of Qatar. One supports the Salafist, one supports the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, those are the people we're allied with in this. But there are allies. There are friends. We have a major military base in Qatar. We certainly have used Saudi Arabia for years. There are allies. But the, the activity is... Disjointed, so the rebels are not presenting a real threat to the government. Next slide. This blob, the area in red is the area controlled by the government, the Assad government. It comes from Damascus up through Homs into Hama, Tartus, Latakia, and almost gets up into Aleppo. The green area is the um, rebels. The yellow area is those Kurds. You got Syrian Kurds here, okay? The blue area is ISIL, ISIS. They're controlling here and they're contesting into the Iraqi area. Here's a rebel area here south, borders on Jordan and Israel. Maybe that's an area where we should be flowing. Turkey has been a strong supporter of the uh, Sunni opposition. They've broken relations with Syria. But, you know, this is about as far as a side can go and his forces can go. They can't go any further. They don't have enough people to overcome the majority. 65 per, to 70% of the people in Syria are Sunni. 10% are Shia. 10% are Kurds. And the rest are a minority of Christians, Druze, and other, other small groups. So it's basically, you know, a conglomerate. We could end up with... Assadistan, the country of Assad, Sunnistan, Isilstan, Kurdistan, maybe allied with Kurdistan in Iraq to form a greater Kurdistan. You know, this country could fall apart. Next slide. Spillover. It's already exacerbated the violence and it's turned into a civil war in Iraq. It could again in Lebanon, which endured a 15-year civil war from 1975 to 1990. Hezbollah, Shia, has got strong support from it. The Sunni population in north and central of uh, Lebanon are supporting the rebels. Four million refugees in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and other Middle East countries. Jordan, the poor country, has got Palestinian refugees. It's got Iraqi refugees. 
It's got more refugees than it's got of its own people. Now. And yet if you've been to the country, it's a, it's a pretty vibrant place. They keep a tight ship there, the king does. But it's straining the thing. And the only thing that's propping it up is us. Sunni jihadists were around the world, to include the United States of America. Last month, an 18-year-old boy from Vero Beach, Florida, martyred himself in Syria. He drove a truck in, exploded the truck, and killed six to eight people. Vero Beach, Florida, 19 years old. What happens to the one that doesn't martyr himself and comes back to Manchester, Vermont? What's he going to do? This is the blowback that we, England, France, Europe, Holland, are facing. When you get 10,000 plus people going, Sunni martyrs, maybe they don't martyr. They come back and decide that they're going to change things here in their country. That's the blowback that, you know, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security is going to have to deal with. It hasn't arrived on our shores yet directly, but it will come, unfortunately. And then you've got Shia volunteers from Iran, from Lebanon and Iraq fighting in Sir, I've just read over the weekend that uh, Hezbollah has a battalion that's fighting in Aleppo, well over 250 miles from Lebanon. And they're fighting with the Assad regime to keep it going on. So that tension between Sunni and Shia is, is major here in this region. Next slide. The good news story, the army is back in charge in Egypt. Democracy is gone, but the army's in charge. It will become a little safer place once they decide who all the terrorists are, or all 150,000 Muslim brothers, the terrorists. Well, the army sounds like they're basically doing, you know, a one-size-fits-all deal. Sweep them all up. They've, they've decimated the national and regional leadership of the brothers, but they haven't gotten into the local cells yet. President Sisi is the fourth, starting with... <coughs> uh, Mubarak, Sadat, and before him Nasser, all came out of the army ever since the 1950s to run Egypt. But there is an existential struggle, and that's where the Sinai comes into play, because there's been a, an al Qaeda affi affiliated group in Sinai that threatens the stability in, the, in that area, which is very important to the peace treaty with Israel, uh, that we are funding between I Egypt and Israel uh, and, and helping to monitor. So, key tourist industries. You know, a bomb goes off at the, um, at the pyramids in Cairo, tourist numbers drop completely. It's a major, you know, several billion dollar a year industry in Egypt, along with the Suez Canal and wages from its workers that work elsewhere in the Arab world are some of the major earnings for this country. That deals with it. So the economy is a shambles. Right now, Saudi Arabia and UAE are backing the government. But their cash supplies aren't endless. And, you know, they may they roll up. So we'll have to see what goes on. But right now they're in charge. It will be. We will have some terrorism. But I think the army will take it in control. And our policy is that if the government has a coup and the army takes control, we have to stop all aid. Well, we haven't stopped all aid because our policy basically has said we need Egypt to keep the peace treaty and for stability in the region. Realism versus, you know, the pursuit of democracy. You have to basically make choices, hard choices in the Middle East. And we're basically opting right now for the Egyptian, the new Egyptian, new democratically elected <laughs> Egyptian government. Okay. Yes, sir. Next slide. I tried on Google Images to find a picture of John Curry with Benjamin Netanyahu and Mr. Abbas. I could not find an image anywhere. Now, my wife and I went to a play in Washington last month called Camp David. And it basically was what happened at Camp David when Anwar Sadat and uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, the Israeli prime minister all got together and basically came up with the Camp David Agreement. It was a pretty tough process. But they were leaders, real leaders, that basically had the problem there. These gentlemen 
unfortunately, in my view, are not the real leaders. They're not the leaders for peace. So Secretary Curry's effort was doomed from the past. You know, additionally, what's happened since then? Since his effort failed in April? Well, the Palestinian Fatah-led government of Abbas basically allied with Hamas that runs the Gaza Strip, and they formed a unity government, put a bunch of technocrats in charge, no one directly from Hamas, but Hamas is behind the scenes and running, running part of it. So they have a unity government. What the Israeli government do? We're going to put in 1,500 more settlement, uh, housing settlements in there. You know, this tit for tat, back and forth, basically destroys trust amongst us. Both sides know what the agreement is. They're going to have to give a little bit the Israelis on the border. The Palestinians are going to have to end up giving up uh, some, some form of sovereignty so that Israel's security is. Really, Jerusalem is going to have to be shared. They're going to have to come to a, you know, some trading of land. But we don't have the leaders, the true leaders right now, in my humble opinion, that are ready to make the deal. So this thing is going to stumble along. You know, the Pope Francis tried to get the two leaders together. It wasn't Benjamin Netanyahu, the head of government, who's head of state, Shimon Peres, 91 years old, who is about to leave office, or has left office, in fact and Mr. Abbas, the president of the two countries. Well, Shimon Perez, besides his long history, you know, had no authority to make a deal. So we're, we're stuck. And of course, as long as there's a civil war going on in Syria, and Lebanese Hezbollah is involved in it, and they're the most dominant force in Lebanon, they're not going to make a deal with Israel. So we're stuck with a Middle East process that's dead in the water right now. I wish there was something I could offer you to say that, yes, it'll come back, but it's not. Not in the near term. Next slide. Oh, we got rid of the major crises. Let's talk about a few others. We got a mini civil war going on between a guy who lived for 20 years in Fairfax City, Virginia, Heftar, basically is leading an army of secularists fighting the Islamists in the Benghazi area. You know, who's he backed by? Is he backed by Egypt? Because the Islamists in, 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 in Libya are backed by Qatar and Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood dominated countries. Yemen, we continue to make strikes with drones against Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula leadership. These were the most, quote, most effective international terrorist orders. We've been decimating them. But each time we make a drone strike, there's also collateral damage, which leads to more martyrs, volunteers for the cause. In Bahrain, very lovely little country, the Shia majority, 85% of the population, wants to share power with the Sunni monarch, monarchy. Sorry, folks, we're not sharing power. So we've got a fundamental problem there. And for us, U.S. Navy Central Command is in Bahrain. It's our largest naval facility in the Middle East, head of the Fifth Fleet. Lebanon, still, you know, 12 different recognized sects have members of parliament. Shia, Sunni, Armenian Christians, Maronite Christians, Greek Orthodox, <coughs> Russian Orthodox, various Christians, Druze, all basically have, an, but Hezbollah has the only militia because it's a national defense militia. It's fought the Israelis for 20 years. They're the dominant power, but they're involved heavily now in the Jordanian monarchy. King Abdullah, that, uh, which, which academy here in, in New England he went to prep school? Deerfield, Deerfield that's it, yes. The Deerfield trained uh, leader who speaks better English than I does and poorer Arabic than I do, because I don't speak very much Arabic. But he's propped up by a bunch of people in his intelligence and security services in the military. They want, and the most of the population has basically said, we're better off with a monarch than going through the mess that Syria, Egypt, and other places is going on by asking for too much power. But it could change. So that lovely little country uh, could, you know, home of Petra, 
and Jerash and places like that that we all love to visit could go the other way. So that was just some other crises points that we could have. Next slide. So what do we expect? Remember now, this is the guy that said back in March, people won't want to listen about the Middle East in this lecture. I want to talk about DIA. So that's the kind of estimator I am. If I get one out of four right, and I did in my career, I should get paid like the shortstop for the Washington Nationals, right? He gets 2.5 million a year to bat 250. One out of four. It's a blinding glimpse of the obvious, more turmoil. It'll ebb and flow, ebb and flow. That's the way it is. Probably decades long. This place is just turbulent area. And what happens when the water runs out? You think the oil is a problem or the natural gas is? What happens if you don't have enough water to support the birth rates of 3.3% every year? It's really going to be an issue at some point. You know, which form of Islam do you follow, Shia or Sunni? Well, Sunnis are about 85% of the population. But the Shias are very militant and demanding their view. So that conflict is going to intensify. The kids that got you Tahrir Square and the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak, they may have gone into exile, but they showed an example that, you know, kid power, you know, cell phone power can work. They want to get in. They want to have democracy. But the autocrats don't want them, and the monarchs certainly don't want them. And then when, when, you know, winner take all. I can confidently predict Iraq, Syria, maybe Libya are going to break up into smaller countries. They may not be de facto like it was done in Yugoslavia, internationally negotiated and recognized. It may de jure. They basically, the Kurds have taken taking the power, they've got a functioning oil industry, they can pay for a government, they've got a strong internal military, they can defend themselves. So you may end up with little mini-statelets to go along with various terrorist groups, rival family clans, and so forth. You know, that's what we're looking at. And unfortunately, you know, the Brahma between Israel and Palestine will continue. We could have a third intifada, but if you've been to Israel, you know how segregated this Palestinian people are. There may be an intifada in the Palestinian-controlled areas. Won't get into Israel if the Israelis have anything to say about it. You know, the security is paramount. But it will still dominate our headlines. So it's getting warm in here. Lots of questions are ready. And I'm, you know, ready to lie, cheat, and steal so I can go have a uh, nice cold beverage after this. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. Can I ask that you repeat the question? Um, okay. Instead of having a group of colonial powers dividing up the Middle East, what do you think about Joe Biden's idea where the country should be divided ethnically uh, with shared power as far as um, monies from the oil revenues, etc. Well, the idea, the first part of the idea is, you know, probably is workable. The second part of the idea is probably not workable in the Middle East culture right now. They're not going to basically share revenues. If I own the oil, it's in my piece of sand, I get to keep it, keep the money that comes from it. It's just not, they're just not built congenitally to share yet. So, I mean, it's a good idea if everyone agrees to it, and that's the other big problem, not everyone will agree to it. You'll have an awful lot of people who say, no, I'm comfortable still being, and you'll have countries like Egypt, which won't want to break up. A country like Saudi Arabia won't want to break up, except maybe the Shia-dominated eastern province, which, oh, by the way, is where most of the oil industry is in Saudi Arabia. So do you think the Saudi monarchy and all those 10,000 princes are going to give up their cash cow? No, sir. No, ma'am. Sorry. Next question. Sir, where does Turkey fit into this equation? It seems to be becoming more dictatorial and certainly very much anti-Jewish. They seem to blame the Jews for everything wrong in the country. 
Well, the Turks have had their own issue. They're still a parliamentary democracy. They just had an election in 2013. The AKP, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood affiliated party, came back in. The Prime Minister Erdogan is back in power. Um, seven years ago, the Turks were the best friends of the Syrians. They had formed an alliance, you know, major economic problem. And once the revolution started and the Sunnis were being attacked, Erdogan changed priorities. And Syria, you know, the Turks have basically helped the revolution. So they're involved, you know, they have a relationship with Israel. It's a correct relationship now. It's not a warm relationship like it was under the uh, Turkish military. But it's a functioning democracy. Yet, there's a lot of domestic protest. Uh, people are going back to, to fight against the, uh, the growing power of the Islamists. So there's a fundamental problem in Turkey as to which way the state is going to go. Does it become more Islamic or less Islamic? You, know, there's... you indicate that Syria, Iraq, will break up into small states. What's the downside? Um, for Iraq? For us. For us? Makes it harder to get oil out. But it also may increase the threat to Israel. The terrorism that's directed, the terrorism that's directed at, against us or against an Iraqi government may now be directed at Jerusalem and the Israeli population. And that's what they're worried about, what's happening right across on the Syrian border. Are these people going to come back across? Right now, the rebels are in control of the area right near the Golan. But they're very concerned about, you know, will the government push forward or will the, will the uh, ISIL take, take control, the more the radical thing? And then will they start going both ways, going to Damascus, maybe going towards uh, the Golan? Yes, ma'am. I keep wondering about the invisible 50% who are currently under wraps. Do you ever see them becoming a factor? And of course, I'm speaking about the women. Um, I wish I could say be optimistic. But what's happened in Egypt? If you, if you see the headlines recently, you know, rape has become a weapon of intimidation. Well, it's always yeah, obviously, but it's become more public. Now, the government is trying to, you know, made a public trial of uh, taking a bunch of people you know, and putting them on trial. But women, you know, still um, are not as important, you know, in the, in, the, in the thing, and the men are not willing to share, unfortunately. And so that, you know, in many countries, the women do control an awful lot, but it's within the family, and it's not within the government or the, or the state and, or in business in, in area. So that's, that's the real issue for them. It's, you know, just getting out of the family dominance, if you will. And it's going to just take time, centuries. Yes, sir. The development of the uh, energy industry in this country, will that have any impact later on, for three or four more years from now? Well, it'll, quote, make us free of energy dependence. But we won't be free because energy is fungible. It moves to where the money is. So it may be that we'll send natural gas overseas in exchange for oil coming from Venezuela or Mexico or Nigeria. Maybe not from the Middle East, but that oil will go to China, Japan, Europe. You know, so that's the issue with it because of the multinational, multinational nature of the oil and gas industry. You know, I think, you know, energy independence is really sort of a misnomer. We'll, we'll you know, we'll be better off, you know. But then we've always been better off because we could pay for it. You know, we consume 3% of the world's population. We consume one quarter of the energy resources of the world. That's just the way it is. Yes, ma'am. Can you say a little bit more about what you foresee happening in Israel politically during the same time frame that you've been talking about the other countries of the Middle East? Um, if you go by the elections, formations of parties, alliances, 
um, Israel's becoming like Italy. It's, it's, it's very hard to get an Israeli coalition together to govern. You basically have to do deals with parties you probably don't want to be involved with. And that's just, uh, just the nature of Israeli politics. So Benjamin Netanyahu has a deal with Naftali Bennett. People like that on the hard right who want no compromise, they're in the government. So what, what, what's his leeway to negotiate if John Kerry or Barack Obama say, I, I want you to come to Camp David and we're going to make a deal here. Well, I got to bring seven different ministers from seven different parties. They all have a say in this. You know, you don't have a leader. So that's the, the, the one effect of no longer one Labor Party or one Likud Party that's dominant, you know, unfortunately. Yes, sir. The administration seems surprised by the speed that ISIS has moved in Iraq. Say they were surprised. Yeah. Was there a failure of intelligence? Well, the problem for the intelligence business in Iraq was when the military pulled out. The question is, the administration was um, uh, surprised by the speed of which ISIS ISIL took power in north and western Iraq. And the gentleman asked, was this an intelligence failure? You're probably right as an intelligence failure. The problem is when the military left, most of the resources that would ca collect all that technical intelligence, the signals intelligence, the imagery, went to other places. And so we were left with the American embassy, Fortress Baghdad. And the people there, if they go out into Iraq, have to go into an armed convoy. And if I'm a spy and I want to meet my source in Mosul and three big black Chevy Suburbans come up, what's going to happen to me the minute they leave Mosul? I'm going to be shot. So we've lost, we've lost the, the ability to collect a lot of the good information. But I think, you're, I think you're right. There probably was a failure because we've turned away from Iraq. And they seized the army before the So the problem with ISIS is that it basically took power through concentrated attacks on cities like Fallujah and Mosul. Small numbers, several thousand, allied with local Sunni tribes who were fed up with the government. They coalesced real quickly and basically drove out the Shia-dominated army, or the army saw this was coming and got out of town real fast. It wasn't a, a, a major military fight. It was a, it was a track race. Who, who can get to Baghdad first? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, wasn't the invasion of Iraq the result of a massive intelligence failure? In what sense would you say a massive intelligence failure? Because I know most of the people were involved in there, um, personally. Well, a, a, an administration that believed that he had weapons of mass destruction sold the war on that basis, uh, was given that information by the intelligence community. Um, wasn't that an intelligence failure? Yeah, it clearly was. There's a long report that's unclassified that you can get on the DNI website, dni.gov, um, and I forget what other websites, but it's the Iraqi WMD failure. It's unclassified, and it tells you what happened as far from the intelligence perspective. Yes, it was a failure. Because when I left the government in, in uh, December of 2000, we estimated that Iraq had a small capacity of, of, of chemical we and biological weapons, several Scud missiles available, and they were still hiding capabilities in all disciplines, nuclear, chemical, biological, from international inspectors. And so what happened in between then, in, in December 2000 and March of two, you know, February 2003, when... Um, <clears throat> Colin Powell appeared at the UN and George Tennant was glowering right behind them, was we were fed a line of BS by the, the, the Iraqi opposition that basically they brought people forward uh, that basically said, yeah, they're making biological weapons, and we bought it. They didn't double-check the information. They, as a failure of tradecraft, 
It was a failure of, of, of assumptions, and that's led to some major changes in the intelligence. Will it prevent future failures? No, it won't, because we're human beings. So, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, this is about the, the nuclear thing was total hogwash. <coughs> well, the other, the other factor, too, was that um, if you, I'm Saddam Hussein and I say to you, chief engineer for the nuclear program, how's my nuclear weapons program <laughs> going along? And my hands on my, my gun. What are you going to tell me? No, we had an awful lot of lying to stay alive in Iraq. We were fed that line it, that people would get that information. It's not an excuse, but that's what happened. But if you read that report, it'll, it'll lay it out in great detail, excruciating detail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.